I, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dave Ripplinger, a bioenergy economic specialist with NDCU Extension uh, and the moderator, organizer of the monthly egg market situation and outlook webinar series uh, with NDSU Extension Agribusiness. Uh, we'll follow the same framework as we have uh, for a few years now. Uh, we'll have a series of presentations uh, and questions at the end. Uh, feel free to use the Q&A tool or the chat tool, uh, and we'll get to your questions at that time. Uh, with that, I'll kick it over to Brian Parman with uh, a look at the world of finance, egg finance, and egg econ. All right. Thanks, Dave. Um, so the big story kind of kind of been prevailing through the macro economy, and it's been trickling through through the ag sectors too, is what's been going on with inflation and the Fed's combating of inflation via uh, the federal funds rate and how that's impacting interest rates. And so today I'm going to go through, again, some of these variables and factors that the Fed looks at so that maybe as you are, you know, reading the news, looking at different things, uh, you can have a gauge yourselves on what the Fed looks at and how they're going, to, how they may react to to some of the information that uh, comes out. And are, when when you're asking, are they going to increase rates further? Are they going to start decreasing rates, et cetera, et cetera? Those those questions I know come to mind because I know that's that's impacting things like equipment purchases, land purchases, the cost of carry when you're when you're storing grain. Interest it obviously impacts that. Uh, the 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 cost to your your operating node and everything else. So obviously interest rates having such a big impact in especially as they increase on agriculture and agricultural lending. And so I'm going to cover a, a couple of the, the or three of the big um, data points that the Federal Reserve looks at when they're making their decision on whether to, what to do with with interest rates and, and the federal funds rate. So the April inflation report, which came out uh, in the April in the April jobs report, came out last week, and uh, consumer inflation, uh, basically overall inflation, they call it, was about four point nine percent, which was the lowest it had been in about a year. Uh, at so almost five percent. However, core inflation was at five and a half percent. So like like I sh uh, was saying in this chart, consumer inflation was four point nine percent, core inflation. Five and a half percent. That's right here, and the big difference again is the difference between uh, core inflation. Uh, you lose food and energy from it due to the uh, variability in food and energy, and the reason in this case that uh, uh, consumer inflation, overall inflation, that is, was below core, is because energy prices uh, have declined quite a bit, and that's that's con uh, considered an overall, but not so much in in the core. And I will say that the Fed tends to watch this core inflation number more closely than the overall inflation number. Again, not that food and energy do not matter. They're just more, more, more volatile, more likely to increase or decrease at a rapid pace. So it doesn't, it doesn't give the Fed as good of an indication of what's going on month over month or how persistent or how sticky or is, is inflation uh, at the time. And then wholesale inflation, that's your producer price indexes, that's up, up the line in the chain was 2.3%. Then the jobs report came out the same week, showed a slowdown in hiring, but a slowdown from really strong hiring. And the labor supply, this was their words in the news, very tight with unemployment around 3.4%, which was the lowest since 1969. So even though you have a slowdown in hiring, uh, there's so many open jobs and so essentially so few people looking for them that the unemployment rate stays around 3.4%. And again, unemployment, along with inflation, unemployment is another big number that the Federal Reserve looks at when they're trying to make decisions on what to do with the interest rate. And then the Fed's target for inflation is 2%. And again, you know, five and a half percent core inflation and 5% overall is still more than double the inflation target that the Fed has set. So then when we look at this, I wanted to just show a chart on what's happened with inflation. That's the red line, core inflation, purple, and then the federal funds target rate. And you can see what they've been doing in each one of these steps has been a, a, a rate increase. And since the rates have been increasing uh, at, uh, last year, We've seen the, the the inflation number come down and that core inflation number come down quite a bit, 
but nowhere near that 2% target, which is, you know, right here, that first line above zero, uh, that's where the target needs to be before, before the Fed probably starts, you know, rethinking it, it, its course in, in general. And just talking about what has actually happened uh, in terms of the, the rate increases, March of last year, it was, it was at a, a basically 0, 0.2, 0 to 0.25%. And from there, it started increasing. So from March to May, gone from a quarter of a percent to a half a percent for, to, for, to uh, five to five and a quarter. So base essentially a 5% increase in the federal funds rate in a year, which is one of the fastest paces uh, really ever. And yet you'd have to go back to the 80s to see anything like that happen. And here's what's happened to fixed rate mortgages uh, since that since that rate increase. And, and I wanted to show it here. So you start back in 2022. OK, so June of 2022, the Fed had just kind of started increasing, increasing rates back here. Uh, really hadn't had a massive impact on interest rates. They were around five percent back in March, more like four. But that last fall is when mortgage rates started increasing at a pretty, pretty rapid clip. Peaking last November at just over 7%. And here in 2023, for the most part, just, just below with a, a brief period, but right around six and a quarter percent, getting close to six and a half percent now uh, compared to where they were. About a year ago, they were more like, like I said, around five or so percent on, on the 30 year. The one thing, and, and this brings me to a point that I wanted to make on that. So, so we look at inflation uh, as, as a number and you say, well, uh, the, federal, the Federal Reserve keeps increasing rates um, and inflation is coming down, but it's not coming down as fast as we'd like. And one of the things the Federal Reserve looks at is, is unemployment, like I said. And why that's important is, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, Unemployed people or folks who are worried about losing their job, perhaps because maybe their company's doing layoffs, they didn't get unemployed, but they're concerned about it. Don't go out and spend a lot of money. And if folks, you know, pare their spending down quite a bit, that helps stop inflation. Well, here's one of the things that's happened the U.S. population growth rate. And I want to, I'm going to tie this into the uh, unemployment rate pretty quick. The U.S. population growth rate since 1948 has done nothing but go down. Uh, when you had the baby boom generation, it was around one, one and three quarters percent. That trend has gone down, down, down. And here we are uh, to this last year and the growth rates around, um, you know, half a percent or less than half a percentage point with a brief spike in 2020 because evidently something happened there and there was some babies born. Now you look at the labor force participation rate. Women entered the workforce in the 60s and 70s. Labor force participation rate went all the way up to 67%. Kind of hung out there for the better part of 20 years and then started declining, rapidly declining uh, after 2010. And then you get to, then you had COVID, this big, this big drop right here at 2020. And then it kind of rebounded some. So what did we have happen? Well, people started retiring, namely that baby boom generation, which was as a percentage, the largest, uh, generation of all time in the US. Uh, in fact, the millennials were the were the were on par with the baby boom generation, but as a percentage of the US, millennials were much smaller. And so then in you see what happened with COVID, the labor force participation rate was up around 63%. And then it dropped a couple of percentage points even when the recovery happened. Essentially people who left didn't come back to work. They just either they decided Maybe they were going to retire and just decided, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to deal with these, uh, whatever the protocols are, I'm going to retire now. The other thing that happened, uh, two income families figured out how to exist on one income due to child care being hard to come by, things like that. They didn't come back to the workforce and they still have it. And so the labor force participation rate is the lowest it's been since about the, the, the 70s, the, the earlier 70s, when again, women were coming into the workforce. So we have a very slow population growth rate. Our labor force participation rate's the lowest it's been in over 45 years, okay? And so then when you have, you look at this, total, total job openings that are non-farm, yes, they've come down since the Fed has uh, started hiking rates some in, in 2022, 
but it's still higher than it's been in recorded history in terms of no total number of jobs. This is the level in thousands. So you got 10 would be, you know, 10 million job openings. And I realize you got qualification issues on who's qualified for what, but if you take it in aggregate, that's a lot of job openings uh, for a, and, and explains partially why this unemployment rate stays so low. So the point of that is, is the Fed is hiking rates and thinking that people are going to curb their spending because the labor, the labor supply is exceeding labor demand as companies do layoffs. Well, that's just not happening in this case, you know, and it, it's kind of a rarity that that's that that's actually occurred, that there are just simply more job openings than there are people to fill them. So even though companies pare down, you don't have this fear of being unemployed for long or losing your job. So people aren't changing their spending habits necessarily. So it's having a harder time having an impact on inflation. And I show this to show, here's the US unemployment rate versus the federal funds rate. And typically as that federal funds rate goes up, the red line, you see that blue line, which is the unemployment rate go up behind it. You know, after the federal funds rate goes up, you see unemployment go up. Federal funds rate goes up, unemployment goes up. Well, in this case, it hasn't really happened, but there again, we have never, we haven't had in many, many, many decades situation where unemployment was this low for, for the reasons that there are right now. And so it just isn't, it just isn't having that big impact that it would have had maybe 20, 30 years ago when, when, when folks were having a more difficult time finding a job or when losing a job meant many, many weeks or months uh, on un unemployment. Now it, that, that doesn't, necessarily mean the case. And so, and I guess it goes back to the, the big point is that when the Fed is increasing um, the federal funds rate, what they're trying to do is change spending behavior to help curb inflation. And if it's not impacting somebody's job, which is one of the big areas that it does, or, or a, a large enough people a group of people's jobs, it's just not having the magnitude of the intended consequence. And, and Frayne actually has some really nice charts uh, that he showed me a week ago about this on the number of um, job openings per unemployed person or per uh, job seeker. And, and it's, it's really astounding. And, and it explains a lot why what's going on here. And then finally, the other one that, that kind of gets looked at is housing prices. And it's not necessarily that the Fed is sitting there pouring over housing prices and worrying about it. It's just that it's also an indicator for are folks changing their behavior? Are things becoming, is our interest rates becoming prohibitive and slowing down folks in buying uh, certain items? And housing is really well tracked. Uh, and it's a big ticket item where interest rates are certainly going to have an impact. If, if anywhere, it's going to be there because of how, how big it changes the nominal payment, how much of an impact it can have. So that's something that's watched. And really, housing prices have stayed you know, they were going up extremely fast since 2020. I mean, you can see the, the the line here, and this is an index, but, you know, they basically held even for the most part over the last year or so. So it hasn't, I mean, it's 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 definitely slowed to some degree, the, the increase in housing prices, but it hasn't negatively affected them yet, right? So maybe some folks who were going to buy are, have have exited and basically started changing some of their decision making on moon with at these interest rates we just can't afford it but it hasn't really had the negative impact on housing prices that other rate increases in the past have had because again the unemployment factor folks aren't really losing their jobs and so they're not changing their behavior as much as they they would have uh, many years ago and then we look at new housing starts too that's another one this is you know new home construction. And we know the price of materials has been high due to inflation. And then, of course, the interest rate, if you're taking a construction loan and, and all these other factors that go into it, new housing starts have come down, but they're still as high as they were before the pandemic. Um, so you see what happened in the pandemic. I mean, you go back, you go to here and new housing starts. Yeah, they're, they're obviously off of 2022, but that was that was a new record high and interest rates were at a historic low. So it has had an impact. But again, we're talking about curbing inflation, not just modestly reducing new housing starts here. So I guess I guess a lot of that is to say that while it has had an impact and we can see it with inflation coming down to a degree, uh, it, it just hasn't had the big overwhelming impact that it would have had maybe several decades ago because of the labor supply right now being in such a, uh, a labor, a job seekers market, so to speak. 
uh, to the point that, that that folks just aren't as worried uh, about losing their job and are, aren't making those tough decisions that they would have had to make in the past. And so finally, I just, you know, to end with, if, you, if you're looking at these numbers and you're wondering, are the, is the Fed in its June meeting going to increase rates another quarter of a percent? Are interest rates going to continue to go up? Are they going to stay up? I'll just leave you with this. Core inflation is one number to look at if you're, if you're trying to see where it was and where it's going. Are they going to increase rates? Well, look at that core inflation number. Is it coming down? If it is, is it coming down fast enough? Um, or obviously, is it going up? Unemployment, another metric that's looked at heavily uh, is the unemployment rate staying low you know and and for or is it going up and, and causing a lot of people to change their behaviors and then to a degree the housing market because that's an indicator of of the cost of big ticket items and how those are being impacted note what i did not put in this presentation is the stock market the fed is not necessarily out there to make sure that the stock market stays at a certain level with how they make their decisions on interest rates. That's not really a, fa a key factor in their decision making. So someone saying, well, if they increased rates another half a percent, it's going to drop the stock, stock market such and such a percent. I don't think that that's nearly as big a factor as many would like to believe. It's it's more about these other indicators here and in and, and their attempt to stabilize prices. And, and I guess the the last thing I'll say on that, don't necessarily expect that just because inflation gets down to around that two to three percent level that they're going to drop rates because i don't think that they will to be honest with you i think they're going to keep them where they are until they have a reason to drop them that the u.s is heading to a big recession or something like that because they were so low for so long one of the concerns folks had was does the fed have the tools anymore if interest rates are so low to actually help uh, minimize the risk of a, a recession or a depression or anything like that. Well, not really if interest rates are already at historic lows. So if things, if if the rates stay around, federal funds rate stays around five, say five and a half percent or something like that, and interest rates are six and a half to seven, and things are clipping uh, along nicely, I don't think the Fed is just going to say, okay, they've been high enough for long enough. We're just going to start dropping them out of the blue. That That isn't going to happen. Uh, there's going to have to be some reason or some something happened to, to cause that uh, reduction in interest rates. So with that, uh, the latest and greatest on uh, interest rates in the Fed. And I concluding my portion of the presentation. All right, let me get started here. Yep, um, and I will turn next. it over to Frayne Olson, who's going to give us... A riveting grain market outlook. <laughs> All right. All right. Let me share my screen now. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, again, Fran Olson. I'm the crop economist, marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Um, this is my contact information. Um, I usually try and encourage you if you do have questions later on or you're thinking something, think of something along the way you want to visit about or, or you want me, want me to try and help clarify, I'd be happy to do that. So I'm going to uh, do several things today. Um, I do want to kind of set the stage here. Uh, there are right now in the markets, there's a few key issues that that are in the news that are impacting market psychology, kind of the attitude and the perception that people have about what prices will be in the future. The first to update some on some information, the Black Sea Grain Corridor Agreement, that agreement between Russia, Ukraine, Turkey and the United Nations. Um, that, that had been put in place several months ago, uh, a little over a year ago now, um, was actually extended for another two months. So uh, May 18th was the deadline for the agreement that was in place. They've, they've essentially kicked the can down the road one more time, um, allowed about two more months for, for some renegotiations. Uh, the key sticking point was that Russia has really been pushing very hard for um, removal of a few key restrictions uh, that, that the West, the United States, Europe, and other, other Western countries have put on uh, uh, restrictive, tr basically restrictive trade for Russia. And they're trying very hard to get some of that stuff removed to make it easier to be able to sell their grain and their, their fertilizer products. So we'll wait to see. The issue is, is still kind of, un it's hanging out there, uh, but we've got two months to be able to worry about it. Second thing, which I'll go through in a few minutes, is that the 
May WASDE report, the World Agricultural Supply Demand Estimates, were released last Friday. Um, they are projecting a record U.S. corn and soybean crop. So total production of corn and soybeans would be at new record levels. This is essentially confirming the estimates that were in the marketplace. So based on the, the, the system that USDA uses to prepare this May report, which is the first time we saw information for the 2023 production year, i.e. the 23-24 marketing year, the crop we're planting now, um, the methodology is they use the information from the prospective plantings report in March, and they use trend line yields. You take those two, you multiply them out. That's how you get the estimate for total production. So not a real big shock value, but just basically confirmation that USDA is looking at some numbers similar to what private forecasters are saying. And I'll talk about that in just a minute in more detail. Another thing I'm going to show you some maps later on. Uh, and some tables for U.S. corn and soybean planting progress is, is either normal or well ahead of normal for this time of year. So again, um, and I'll, I'll talk more in detail about that, but not only we're looking at a trend line yield, which would be an average yield adjusted for technology, but potentially if the weather maintains and, and we have a good growing year, we might have above average yields, which again would put additional downward pressure on pricing. Um, hard red winter wheat conditions, primarily that Kansas, Oklahoma, uh, Texas, Colorado uh, wheat is in poor condition. We're starting to get some more reports from the winter wheat uh, tour. I'll give you a little bit of information and update on what we have so far. However, just as a caution, the soft red winter wheat crop, which is primarily Southern Illinois, uh, Missouri, parts of Kentucky, um, also into uh, actually into um, um, Wisconsin and Michigan, that soft red winter wheat crop is actually in pretty good to above average conditions. So the winter wheat crop, which is larger by bushels, is has really been the focus, but the soft red winter wheat is partially offsetting that. So when we look at total wheat production, the, the verdict is still out. And finally, especially in the corn market, um, corn, as I've talked about earlier, corn exports have been relatively weak. All, all season long, I mean, all winter long, they've been well behind the pace that we had last year. Um, and to add kind of fuel to the fire here, recently China has canceled several, several ocean vessels of U.S. wheat or U.S. destination wheat. Um, and, you know, this isn't unusual for the Chinese to do that. Basically what's happening is there's a penalty to cancel that fee. Well, the prices have dropped far enough that they can pay the penalty go back into the marketplace and repurchase the corn at a cheaper rate. And so we're starting to see some of that happen, which means that our total U.S. export volume may not be as large as what we had first intended. Again, all of these things with larger production and, and potentially a little bit weaker demand is, is causing the markets to, to be in a pretty, pretty heavy downward shift right now. So let's do a very quick recap on the WASDE report. Again, these are the end forecasts for ending stocks for corn, for corn, soybeans, and all wheat, all the classes of wheat blended together. Um, as I usually do, the top row is what the trade was expecting. So these are the private analysts and forecasters that put together their, their own numbers and what they think the ending stocks or the amount of grain we're going to have in the bin just before harvest will be. So the blue line on top is the average trade estimate. Uh, the black line towards the bottom, the, the bolded line is the information USDA presented last month. And of course the red line on the very bottom, it would be the numbers that we got last Friday. So typically I want to compare the blue line, blue row, excuse me, to the red row saying, this is what we expected to see versus what we actually saw. So this would be ending stocks for old crop. If you notice my title up here, I'll get my little cursor going. This would be for old crop grain. So it'd be the 22-23 marketing year. Now for wheat, there was no changes. Um, and again, because of the averages, you know, the average was looking for a slight increase in wheat ending stocks. We didn't get that. We basically had the same number. For old crop corn, um, the, the trade was expecting a slight increase above last month's number. The increase is a little bit larger than we'd expected. Um, all of that change from last month to this month was because of a, a reduction of about 75 million bushels of uh, wheat, uh, excuse me, of corn exports. So based upon the current export pace, 
some of these more recent cancellations. The, the USDA forecasts are starting now to reflect that slowing demand for U.S. corn exports. And as a result, if we don't sell it, we'll have it in inventory. That inventory can then be used next year if, if we need to. Finally, on the soybean column, relatively minor changes. There's just a, a small little tweak um, in the amount of soybeans imported. Um, and again, I can't explain all of the details behind that, but it was it was just a very, very minor uh, adjustment. And so I would say that the USDA numbers came in basically identical to what the trade was expecting. Now, if we shift to new crop, notice that the titles have changed here. Now I flip the numbers. So here's the new crop numbers for the 23-24 ending stock. So as I mentioned earlier, May is the first month that USDA actually puts formal forecasts together for production and consumption of the new crop, the crop we're planting right now. So these are uh, these are basically all, all estimates, they're forecasts. The one number that we do have as a survey-based information, of course, is the forecast for project for planted acreage, which came from the farmer survey in March. So very quickly, let's compare the, the row on top in green, which is our trade estimates versus the row on the bottom in red. I apologize for those that are colorblind. Uh, red and, and uh, green don't always mix um, very well for some folks. Uh, but if you look at the, at compare those, oops, wait a minute, what happened here? Oh, um, these should be, what did I do? Oh, I am sorry, I copied the wrong numbers. Um, I don't have the information for new crop and old crop. The numbers are the same. I apologize. The bottom, the the uh, the summary of it, I, I will correct this uh, as we post it on the web. Uh, the summary for new crop is that our, for all of the major crops, corn, soybeans, and all wheat, ending stocks are forecast to increase. Okay, so they're going to be higher levels for 2023 than we saw in 2024. Now, most of those numbers came in pretty close to what the trade is expecting, um, with the exception of corn. The corn number uh, for ending stocks, uh, what USDA is forecasting versus the the uh, the trade estimates were a little bit higher than what the trade was expecting. So I apologize for the for the uh, the, the the error in in preparing my materials. Uh, we did get a minor adjustment, minor tweaks to what's going on in South America right now. Most of the Brazilian soybean crop has been harvested. Um, a large portion or essentially all of the first crop corn in Brazil has been harvested. Second crop corn is pretty much finished planting right now. We'll have to wait to see how the, the second crop corn develops as we go through the rest of the summer. Um, for Argentina, we're still wrapping up the soybean and corn harvest in Argentina, we're trying to put the kind of the wrap on the final numbers. Uh, the trade is expecting a, an additional decrease in Argentine soybeans as well as corn. And that's really coming out of some of the private analysts out of South America. Um, I, I don't think USDA was quite ready to lower those numbers, but I do expect them to come down as we get into June. I think the June report uh, USDA will adjust their forecast for, for Argentine corn and soybean production to be more in line with what we're seeing from the private estimates. So even though they didn't make a lot of changes right now, I do expect a few more changes coming in the June report. So let me shift gears a little bit and talk about corn planting progress. So every, every Monday we get an estimate of the planting progress as well as crop conditions now starting pretty soon for the major crops we have in the United States. And it's by, by state. Now this is planting progress. And I just wanna highlight a couple states. There's actually 18 corn states that are monitored every week. So we can monitor and, and see how, the pro how things are progressing as we move forward. So this information is from last Monday. It was actually collected over the weekend and summarized. It was reported on Monday morning, or excuse me, Monday afternoon. I guess the, a couple key points I want to make. The, the, the states highlighted in blue at the very top, Iowa and Illinois, if you notice where they are, the, the blue meaning May 14th, this is 2023, both uh, Iowa and Illinois are 86 to 84% planted um, as of last week versus the five-year average of being anywhere from 72 to 63% planted. So the really big corn states of Iowa and Illinois are well ahead of their normal planting progress. When we look at some of the other major states and the, the numbers that I have in little parentheses behind 
each of the states is uh, the number of acres that are planted. It's not necessarily production, but the number of acres seeded. So Iowa has the most corn acres seeded, Illinois is number two, Nebraska is number three, et cetera. When we look at the, the states that are highlighted in black, they're very, very close to their normal pace. So there's a large portion of kind of that uh, central and western corn belt that is pretty much on normal pace versus you get central and eastern portion of the corn belt and they're well ahead of the normal pace. And of course we have what I would call the outlier, which is North Dakota. We're well behind what our five-year average is. We're very similar to what the pace was this time last year, which again was e exceptionally slow because of the wet cold spring we had last year. Now, some of the things, as I think most farmers are finding out, soil moisture conditions are not as dry, or excuse me, not as wet this spring as they were last spring. So with, with crossing my fingers, hopefully we'll be able to catch up on some of that planting progress. The reason I'm bringing this up and pointing it out specifically is that I don't want people to get this backyard syndrome, that just because it's really slow and, and planting progress is well behind in my area, you know, I get this common question as well. Doesn't the, don't the markets know that we're behind? And the short answer is yes, they do know they're behind. That you guys are behind. But this is an isolated problem to North Dakota, uh, parts of Minnesota, northern Minnesota, a few parts in South Dakota as well as Montana. So it's really a northern plains problem. It's not necessarily a core central corn belt problem. If we look at soybeans, a very similar story. So we get our number one and number two. Uh, soybean states of Iowa and Illinois, well ahead of the of the normal planting pace. So they're getting the soybeans in the ground early. Crop conditions haven't been been um, been forecast yet because it really isn't out of the ground. But at least there's this expectation that we may get average yields or even possibly above average yields, depending on what's going on. Then you move into the kind of the next tier down for acreage when we look at Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska. Again, heavy soybean states. They're either at pace or well ahead of normal planting pace for soybeans. And then we get to North Dakota, which is again, the red one, okay, that, that we're well behind where we typically are. Now, again, that's a relatively small number, so it wouldn't take much of a, of a surge in planting and planting progress to be able to catch up to the five-year average, but we are starting kind of behind the gun and behind normal pace. Um, the last one I just want to touch on is spring wheat. Um, obviously, we're, we're still trying to put spring wheat in the ground. We made some substantial progress, I know, in western and central North Dakota this last week. Um, so I do expect the information we get on uh, uh, coming Monday, next Monday, to be better, but we are still well behind. And really, the only the only region that is uh, nor, near normal pace is Idaho, but that Idaho region plants very, very little few acres of, of uh, spring wheat. A lot of it's winter wheat or or um, or white wheat, uh, they have very little hard red spring wheat. So again, the 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 soybean planting progress nationally is is all uh, obviously behind what we would like to see. So how do we put this into into perspective? I also want to show the soil moisture conditions because I'm going to show you the uh, winter wheat ratings here in just a minute and talk and then end up my discussion with uh, what's happening within the the Kansas wheat tour, the winter wheat tour. Give you an update on what's going on. So, this is a map of soil estimated soil moisture conditions, uh, basically on based on water holding capacity, uh, from a, a joint effort between NASA that does the satellite imagery as well as USDA that tries to ground truth and correlate the satellite imagery along with what they're getting from from soil based or actual uh, observation based um, calibration systems. So they've been doing this for quite a while. I think they're zeroing in on some information that, that will be very, very useful as we move forward in time. So I don't wanna put a lot of pressure on these numbers or this information, but it does give you a very quick visualization. Um, so if you look at something with a dark green or a blue, if you look at the scaling on the far, far right-hand side, the soil moisture conditions, it, it looks like it's, it's uh, towards the upper end of normal or excessive. By the time you get into the blue areas, there gets to be temp typically uh, saturated soils. If you look at the lighter green or the pale green, and then you get into the yellows and the oranges and the reds, those are well below um, normal soil moisture conditions. Now this is an estimate for the top three feet, about the top meter of soil. 
So think of that as the normal soil, uh, the, 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 the root depth within the soil. So our drought monitor map typically shows the amount of soil moisture in the full soil profile. Um, and then there's some other droughts like the polymer drought index, which is a variation of this, uh, looks at uh, more of a surface moisture uh, conditions rather than looking specifically at that soil depth or at the, excuse me, the root depth. Now you can see that we really have kind of two separations and it tends to be this border uh, between that runs from the central plains and back into the corn belt. So we look at the core corn belt states of Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, even into Ohio, uh, Kentucky, Missouri. The central and eastern corn belt has got adequate to, to possibly saturated soils. And even as we get into southern Minnesota, some very, very good soil moisture conditions. Uh, again, planting progress is well ahead of normal. Then you get into the central plains area. Now, North Dakota, because of the rains that we've had over the last this last spring and some of the snowfall, that soil moisture, at least within that top three feet, has been recharged. But as you get south into Nebraska and then into Kansas and also into the panhandle of, of Texas and Oklahoma, things change a bit. The reason that western Kansas is a, that pale green is because they did have some rain showers that came through, actually some pretty significant rain showers, came through a little over a week ago. And so some of that uh, soil moisture now is being reflected in this map. So the areas that we really need to be concerned about now, in, in particular, even with corn and soybean planting, if you think about Kansas, it's really Eastern Kansas is where most of the corn and soybeans are. Central Kansas is that transition zone, just like North Dakota is. And by the time you get out to Western Kansas, most of that is irrigated corn and also dry land wheat. So let's talk just a little bit now about my last slide, which is the Kansas wheat tour. Um, so it's going on right now. Today is the last day. It's actually a three-day tour of primarily Kansas, but it does touch Northern Oklahoma and Southwest Nebraska. So it does kind of loop across the border just a little bit to get some samples uh, around, just around the borders of, of Kansas as well. So the results from day one, again, it's a three-day three -day, uh, trial, a three-day tour. Um, we'll get the information today and then they'll put out their final uh, final official forecast based on, on what they have saw, seen and observed and measured. So day one, uh, the weighted average for the day one route was about 20, almost 30 bushels per acre, 29.8. Um, relative to last year's uh, estimate, which again was somewhat ha hampered or, or hindered by uh, some drought conditions in, in Western Kansas as well, was actually about 10 bushels higher. So notice last year at this time, they were forecasting 39.5 bushel average for that particular route on day one versus about 29.8 today. So about a 10 bushel reduction per acre for that year, day one route. When we look at day two route, the stuff from yesterday, um, slightly different part of the state, 27.5 uh, bushel uh, per acre estimate as a weighted average yield versus last year's number at 37. Again, about a 10 bushel spread between what we saw last year versus what we're picking up in the survey this year. We'll have to wait to see what day three shows us and what the final numbers are. But I suspect, I'm guessing, based on the initial findings here in day one and day two, that we're probably looking at about a 10 bushel differential from last year to this year. So if we translate that into USDA's forecasts, again, this, would, this comes from the May production estimates, which were released the same day as the WASDE. So uh, currently USDA is, is forecasting at the average Kansas wheat yield to be 29 bushels per acre versus last year, the number that they reported was 37 bushels per acre. So that's about an eight bushel spread. Now, the thing, the reason I'm bringing this up is even though we're getting new news and confirmation essentially that yes, that Kansas wheat crop is in tough condition, that it's going to be a, a very low yield, that we're not going to have as many bushels of hard red winter wheat as we first expected, there, a lot of this information has already been kind of baked into or, or considered by the market as already embedded in that. We might get a little bit of a, a, an additional bump, an additional support, I guess, lifting of prices uh, because it's a little lower than what the USDA numbers had. But again, a lot of this information is already embedded in the futures markets that we see today. So as we move forward, we're going to have to have some additional information. 
uh, to try and get us, uh, put some more lift back into the market. We've had quite a bit of a retracement now in corn, soybeans, and wheat over the last week or so. I know that there's some farmers getting very concerned, not only about new crop pricing, but also about uh, catching up on some old crop uh, inventory sales. So um, I'm, I'm really, I guess my best guess right now, if I were to forecast and look forward, I do think we're going to start uh, finding a bottom here. I think we'll have some temporary lows. We'll likely rebuild a little bit off of these marks, um, off of the prices we're seeing today. But it's going to take a little bit. And as long as we continue to have good weather and the expectation for very large production uh, numbers coming out of, of the U.S. again this year, um, I, I'm afraid that the path of least resistance is still lower as we go through on our, our pricing. So with that, I will. I am finished. I will stop sharing here and give uh, Tim Petrie the floor and let him continue. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, again, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Today, I'm just going to give you a quick update of uh, some market classes of cattle and then talk a little bit about summer grazing since we have had some moisture. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in history here because I've talked about that before. Again, on all my charts, the green line is 2020. The purple line 2021, the blue line last year, and uh, the red line, what we're going to focus on is uh, this year, and then the red squares, this year's futures, and then the orange on uh, next year's futures. So well, we've seen a uh, nice improvement in fed cattle started off there around 160, and actually we hit an all-time record weekly high there a couple of weeks ago at 180.44. I've backed off a little bit, and uh, I think in some respects, that has some good news with it, even though it backed off a little bit in that we're looking at a more normal seasonal trend. The last two years, we were just up, up, up uh, throughout the year, trying to catch up after COVID and so on. So the normal seasonal patterns for fed cattle to go up in April, down into June and August as the future. So there in the red bars and then pick up at the end of the uh, end of the year. And so uh, looks like a normal seasonal pattern, meaning that there aren't black swan events affecting us like have happened before. We are at record levels. Our previous record high fed cattle for the year was 2014, back when we had uh, low numbers. And uh, following up on that, on January 1st of this year, our num cattle numbers, beef pound numbers are even a little bit below where they were in 2014. So We've got a lower calf crop, and that's positive for prices. And then again, those gold are uh, are even higher next year. But we've been ahead of the uh, uh, of the record high in 2014 the entire year. So quite likely we'll set it again. The USDA in the recent WASD is predicting 166.50 uh, for this year, and then for next year 172.25. So. The two biggest things that affect feeder cattle are fed cattle, and, and particularly those futures when those calves or feeder cattle will hit the market, which would be now more the, uh, at least for calves in particular, the uh, the uh, gold line up there. And so uh, the two things that, have, that would affect it would be that. And then corn, and Rain has already talked about corn for and how that affects will affect feeder cattle. And the, the, the big takeaway there is we're, projecting a record high corn crop, which would uh, tend to be lower prices, which would be supportive to feeder cattle. So go look at the calves again. Uh, uh, calf prices have just marched ahead the entire year up there. And again, uh, a week ago, although not at weekly high records, uh, are above the average. The last record high average was in 2014, back again when we had the, the cyclic to low cow herd and now a little bit below that. And we, again, back to off seasonally. Again, calf prices usually go up into April and then just maybe back off a little bit and on a pretty level until we get to the fall when they go down. Again, that blue arrow in the bottom right-hand chart there, October 15th is all, is about the low there. But uh, we're at, at levels that we haven't seen since the uh, uh, beginning of 2014 or, or so. And and uh, but but because we started off lower and the you know the record high was 250, we're probably going to end the year at least a, a little bit below record high, but still at good levels. Go to the heavyweight yearling cattle again. The same thing. We've just been marched up and up and up as fed cattle went up and as corn has went down. We have that opposite relationship. Change corn since since a bushel 
10 cents a bushel, change uh, feeder cattle a buck in the opposite direction. And so corn has been going down and we have fewer numbers. We're gonna have the uh, even fewer calves to sell this year than we had last year. So we move to those fall futures uh, for feeder cattle are up there. Uh, September that today was right up at the 237, I think when, when it closed there. And again, uh, that would at, at least those prices that higher at record high levels. We started off lower. The all time record I average was 208. And we're certainly gonna be uh, close to that. So um, gonna talk a little bit about summer grazing then. So just keep those fall futures up there at those levels in mind that are up there at 238. And the big question is then, you just saw the calf chart, calf prices up, uh, you know, around 260 or whatever. And uh, and uh, so they are expensive. So how will that work in a summer grazing program? Well, then keep in mind that also the fall futures are fairly high. And so here uh, we do have on our website a summer grazing budget that you can use. And we have an example there, but on the, it's a Excel spreadsheet. So you can put your numbers on the right hand side to compute yours. Just a couple of key things there towards the buck. I'm not gonna go through all those costs. You can put in your own number of acres it takes per head and the, your uh, cash rent or what you could rent it for, your opportunity cost or whatever, and on down those costs. Go down and concentrate on those blue circled numbers. For the beginning calf value, 550 pound steer calf. I used 260. How did I get that? Well, I went to last week's market report for the markets reported by USDA in North Dakota. And you see in that blue circle there in the middle, there were a wide range in prices, 236 uh, up to 263 with about a 255 average. So I went to, to just towards the top of that, kind of being conservative there at, uh, at uh, 260 in for calves and then my uh, down a little bit to the uh, left. Uh, I used 225 for a projected price for September. Again, that's very conservative because the September futures today closed at 237, you know, $12 higher. But it, given my example here, then we have a uh, uh, the, the next blue circle uh, break even of about 208. Uh, again, well below what the futures market is now. And so, but with, with those examples would give us about a $134 per head profit. However, if you go down, I didn't circle it, but if you have a 10% lower price where that next red arrow down is, you would lose money. So with that, you know, there is risk in the market. The, the corn isn't completely planted yet and a long way from that. And remember that relationship. So uh, I think that uh, price risk management is still something we can should consider, especially on a seasonal basis thing like summer grazing, because you sell all the cattle on September 15th or whatever, you're at the mercy of the market then. And then we have, you know, the economy and, you know, you know what's weather gonna do? It's still dry in Western North Dakota, res rain ranch and really dry down in, in the Kansas on down into Texas and so on, and the economy and, geopolitics, all things that could cause risk and volatility. So, uh, you know, there are a number of things that, again, the futures market is up at good levels there, uh, 237 in September. And uh, so if you want, can use and, and are used to using the futures or options market, you can do that. You could do a video auction, uh, a lot of interest more so than ever in uh, livestock risk protection insurance from USDA. So I pulled just last night's offering from uh, the LRP. And uh, and so uh, this was good until nine this morning. A new one will come out this afternoon at 4.30. And uh, one advantage of course of LRP is that you can do any number of futures markets, 50,000 pounds, but here you could do one head or five, 10, 15, 20, whatever number that you want and you pick the weight. So uh, left, Circled in green is the co highest coverage price offered for uh, September 13th delivery, mid-September, uh, mid when the cattle will probably come off pastures. The USDA was offering a price of 231. Uh, and, uh, and well, right to the 
to the left of that, then their expected ending value is 233, which on the bottom yesterday, September futures closed at uh, 233.95, but they're up $3 today at 237. So when this comes out this afternoon, we're going to see even higher coverage prices or lower premiums or both. So we could lock in 231.20 uh, yesterday for a $5, 100 weight premium. Uh, and then they offer prices at $2 increments down, 229, 227, and so on. And that lowers the premium. One thing I just went down and I picked the lowest offering for September of 213.20. And, uh, and uh, the reason I did that is because, again, back to that break even price of 208, at least based on my estimates there, that lowest uh, offering would still be above our break even price. So, again, the key here is is uh, if you're a producer getting in and talking to your lender, or if you're a lender discussing this, you know, with with producers to decide what you want to do and how much risk you are and how much premium you want to pay. But uh, you know, we'll have even on the bottom side there probably a couple more dollars higher for about the the same premium today with the offering. And so uh, again, uh, summer grazing looks profitable. And you got to have the, the grass, however. And again, I know it's dry in places. And uh, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Ron. Um, for the interest, in the interest of time, I'm just going to uh, go right into this spreadsheet. Um, uh, this spreadsheet is a, a prevent plant decision tool. And uh, we've updated it with, with uh, new rules that have been in effect for a couple of years here now as far as haying and grazing go. Um, it's, it's on the extension website, very easy to find. Uh, you just go to Ag Hub, go to Farm Management, and scroll down to the bottom. There's a tile where you click on it. Um, before I get into it, uh, uh, with this Excel spreadsheet, you have to have Excel on your computer to run it. The tab on the bottom, you can flip over and look at the final planting dates for your county. Um, we're getting to the point of getting close to, there might be, we're, we're surpassed some um, canola final planting dates in certain counties, and we're getting close to the final planting date for corn uh, in, some parts of the, in some parts of the state. And um, so the prevent plant situation doesn't look as bad as we thought it was gonna be, but here's a decision tool. If, you, if there are certain areas that, uh, that are getting close, you may wanna decide on what to do here. Um, it, as with any decision tool, garbage in, garbage out, um, all the yellow cells you can change and the other ones are protected. Let's just have this example here where we're gonna have spring wheat and it's getting kind of late. We have a choice of whatever crop we're, we're, we're talking about. Uh, and this is whatever crop that's actually paid on your insurance history. Um, uh, you may have wanted to plant spring wheat, but you may have some corn history, and then you would put the corn crop here. But let's, for example, let's say it's spring wheat, APH is 50. We have our choice of coverage levels, whatever coverage level you had for your insurance. And prevent plant coverage is free. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's automatically included in your premium, but you can buy it up. The coverage, uh, the free coverage is 60% for most crops. 55% for corn, 50% for dry beans. That's a percentage of your normal um, normal identity. If you wanna buy it up, you can buy up 5%. And in this program here, we have an option to buy it up yes or no. And we'll for this example, we'll just keep it at yes. And if uh, the program pulls in the, uh, the price, uh, price for wheat uh, this year and it calculates the indemnity payment. Then the question is, uh, if you're going to plant a cover crop, are you going to use this for seed or grain for your own use or for sale? And uh, this is not allowed. If you say yes in this box, it'll reduce your um, indemnity by 65%. Okay. If you say no, you're not going to use it for seed or grain, then it leaves that. If you have a cover crop, you can enter your expenses here, whatever they may be, and it totals them down here. This next box here, uh, this this is it include any gra hay or grazing value of your own use. You are allowed, but crop insurance has a uh, RMA has allowed you to hay and graze any thing, any cover crop on your PP acres for your own use. You also are allowed to sell hay 
from your from this or or rent it out for grazing. Whatever dollars you get from from that hay or grazing, you should put in here for a proper analysis, and it will be added actually subtracted from your indemnity here, added, added to your indemnity here, I should say. If you do sell some seed or grain from that and you have chosen to reduce your indemnity, it, it maybe there's a point where you can sell it and be better off. You would put any number here, uh, uh, you would just add that in. Then what it's comparing to is if a crop is actually planted there. Okay, now we have soybeans here as an example, but let's say you want to plant wheat. You can choose wheat down at this bottom block, and it will it'll be just you would just choose it to plant later. But let's say for this example, you're just going to plant soybeans. You figure it's too late for wheat. Your APH is thirty. You enter that in whatever kind of policy you have, whether it be revenue, yield, or APH. Um, you enter your uh, coverage level whatever it was for that you chose. Um, and um, also it pulls in the, the price and the prices are pretty good this year for coverage, 1376 for soybeans. Then you need to make some guesses here. What will the futures price be? This is for the harvest price option. Let's just put in three, 1350. How many days late are you gonna plant it? Let's just put in five days late. Now I'm gonna scroll down to the bottom here to read the fine print. Um, uh, where you enter the number of days uh, 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 that you're going to plant late, it does vary by crop. For canola, it's reduced by 1% per day for the first five days, and then 2% per day for the next 10 days, okay? For most crops, it's reduced by 1% per day for the next 25 days. Lentils, so, or so, sunflowers for the next 25 days. Um, late planting for peas and lentils, uh, uh, 20 day, uh, 20 days for sunflowers, 15 days for for other crops. Just read the fine print down here and decide uh, uh, what you want to do for that. Um, let's just assume that your your yield will probably reduce some uh, for planting late, 26 bushels. Then the guess is, what's the market price going to be? Just put in 13. You multiply that out, you get 338, and then you put in uh, uh, you put in your costs for that crop. Uh, you do not need to include your sunk costs, such as such as land, rent, machinery dep depreciation. That's cost you're going to have to pay regardless. So this is all added up here. So basically, you just take this 154, subtract one, one, uh, uh, 169, and you actually actually get um, $14.79 as a negative number. Then you need to read the fine print again. The positive number... Uh, indicates it's a greater return uh, per acre from, from PP than from seeding. If it's a negative number, which it shows here, based on the numbers you put in, uh, it, it shows it, it's a, a, a loss from PP rel, rel, relative to planting a crop. Probably a best guess would be to plant some soybeans. Very close there for a minus $14 an acre. This next chart here shows that 26 bushels. And then it just assumes if you got a lesser yield or a greater yield from that, what the numbers would calculate out to be. The next one shows a chart here um, that shows you this basically illustrates that table. So there's our there's our, our, our prevent plant decision tool. I wanted to demonstrate that. Uh, there may be some situations now in the next in the next week or so, uh, people might want to make decisions on whether they want to keep planting or if it's too wet. So with that. Uh, I, any questions, just please contact me. Well, you, you, I'm sure you have my contact information. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, David Ripplinger. Great. Thanks, Ron. Uh, so I'm going to provide some, some additional comments about renewable natural gas. Pretty sure I've talked about this at least one time in the last year or so, uh, but it's a little bit more timely with some developments here in the region. Uh, so just some background, what renewable natural gas is. So RNG is methane. Uh, Chemically, it's methane, but it's produced uh, using an anaerobic digester and manure, typically, or some other feedstocks. So oftentimes, you'll see folks throwing in uh, straw, stover, uh, even uh, even sometimes crops, uh, depending on how they want to adjust their mix for different purposes. Um, but anything that you 
put into a digester, the bacteria is going to work on it and produce methane and other things. And that methane, when cleaned up, is referred to as renewable natural gas. Uh, up until recently, uh, we've seen a lot of digesters on dairy farms across the United States, really because of manure management uh, and the environmental issues uh, concerned with that. Uh, and, and, you know, doing the economics, which I have done pretty regularly over the last five years, 10 years, usually is a break even uh, proposition and then maybe made enticing with uh, some USDA programs. Uh, but now the, the economics have really changed with some, some carbon policy. Uh, the reason I, I kind of brought this up today is there's now a large project uh, in North Dakota, up in Pembina County, Bathgate, uh, where they are making a major investment in a renewable natural gas facility. When I look at this, uh, this project, to me, that really is the driver. Uh, there's other benefits because of it. Uh, but this existing uh, uh, farmer feedlot operation is going to add the capacity to uh, feed 1,500, excuse me, 15,000 head of cattle, so it's very large, on slatted floors, uh, and that manure is gonna go to a digester, uh, produce renewable natural gas, uh, fertilizer, digestate uh, as well. Um, and just if you note that, obviously the scale uh, of this facility is very large. And then of course that slatted floors. One of the things that really has prevented a lot of uh, producers in animal agriculture in our part of the neck of the woods from doing this is we really don't have access to uh, manure that is uh, able to go into a digester and, and, and not foul the digester easily. By having a, a slatted floor like uh, dairy or swine certainly have, uh, it, it avoids that, that, that issue. Obviously, there's, there's a capital cost on that as well. Uh, the reason all this is happening is California policy. Um, so low carbon fuel standard, as we've talked about many times before, uh, they incentivize low carbon fuels. Renewable natural gas is one of them. And based on the the, the amount of, of, of natural gas produced and the carbon footprint and the price of, of those carbon credits, projects like the one in Northern North Dakota have been extremely profitable. And in fact, we've seen billions of dollars move into agriculture in the last two, three years uh, to uh, see these investments made on farm. A lot of what's happened is movements of capital to the dairy industry or the swine industry, uh, adding these digesters to existing facilities. Here we have uh, more just, a, you know, an almost uh, separate expansion. You know, they're adding, a, you know, a, a large number of cattle uh, to take advantage of this. So the question is, why are we looking at RNG or why is it so advantageous? And the chart on the right is kind of difficult to, to break up. It is from California Air Resources Board, which oversees the LCFS. Um, the reason why renewable natural gas is because its carbon footprint is so low. And in fact, it's typically negative and often uh, extremely negative. So if you look at that chart on the right, we have a, a number of different fuels, both biofuels uh, and fossil fuel based uh, fuels. And if we go down about two thirds of the way, you see that yellow line and it's bio CNG is covered up. Um, that CNG is compressed natural gas. That is renewable natural gas for our purposes here. But you can see how that line goes much further to the left than almost anything else. The only one that gets close is bio LNG, which is basically the same thing, just liquefied instead of compressed. And again, if we, we look at that difference between the fossil fuel LNG, which is just which is between those two, and where bio LNG uh, bio CNG is, that difference can all be uh, captured uh, in those carbon credits in California. So as we have that bigger spread, more credits are, are produced. Uh, and then that is a tradable instrument and can generate large sums of money. Um, one of the questions you might get is like, what, how can its carbon footprint be so low uh, for renewable natural gas? And really what's happening is we're trading on farm emissions in the form of methane. Uh, for tailpipe emissions for CO2. So if I have uh, manure on the farm and I, and I don't manage it well, at least immediately some of that's gonna be methane. Methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, uh, much more impactful than CO2, 24 times as much uh, for, for uh, a hundred year time frame. Or I can have CO2 when I, when I burn uh, compressed natural gas, liquefied natural gas, uh, for 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 power for for transportation. So again, that's where the trade is. We're, we're taking 
methane, which is very potent in doing CO2 instead. So you're really swapping those uh, and avoiding a significant amount of emissions. So just so you kind of understand the magnitude, some of these numbers might not mean much. Uh, right now, the, the, the spot price of natural gas is about $2 per MMBTU, which is substantially lower than it's been the last two years. Um, much higher than you're actually going to pay here in North Dakota uh, for a couple of reasons, especially once it finally gets to, to consumers or businesses. But just so I understand, so that's that's pretty close to what the, the, the spot price is. Um, if we look at the difference in that carbon intensity, so where that fossil fuel number was all the way over to uh, that low end for, for carbon footprints, it could be as much as 600 grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule. Again, don't, don't have to worry too much about that right now, but that substantial difference and that current price of carbon. And so I'm going to present this to you as a quiz. And if anybody wants to take a guess, um, but my, my quiz for you and other specialists, you're welcome to answer this as well. Um, you might not want to do it for the record, but what is the value of those carbon credits for each MMBTU? Again, an MMBTU is that standard measure we use for, for natural gas uh, in North America. So again, the price of the natural gas is $2. The value of the carbon credits created with this renewable natural gas is, all right, drum roll, $40 in MMBTU. So 20 times as much. So massively dwarfs the, the price of that natural gas. So if I'm a farmer, I collect this manure, I produce this natural gas, as long as it can hit a pipe uh, that's part of the national uh, natural gas pipeline network, and I have an approved pathway with, with California, I'll be able to sell that physical for $2, but I'll also generate $40 in carbon credits. Uh, so it's a su substantial amount of money, especially relatively speaking. Uh, just looking a little bit on some, some methane math, uh, just how much methane we can expect per animal. And this is some, some numbers from uh, uh, Purdue Extension. It's actually not that much. And this would be methane coming off of the digester, uh, you know, substantially more. And this is, it's an interesting measure. It's per thousand pounds of animal. Um, so we have a disproportionate amount of methane production for dairy per thousand pounds of animal, uh, beef and swine, you know, a little bit less than that. But anyways, if you just look at these numbers, so if we have this average weight uh, animal, um, these are actually taken from, from Purdue. So a 1,300 pound dairy cow, 900 pound uh, had a beef cattle, 150 pound hog. And just I, I just picked these numbers for the number of head for an operation, just for an example. Um, and then I could calculate the amount of natural gas, that's the MCF per day. And then finally, that annual revenue. And now you can suddenly see for relatively moderate sized operations, you're talking about a significant amount of revenue. And this is a revenue in addition to other benefits. And of course, financially, you know, traditionally, you'd have that fertilizer benefit. You might sell that natural gas or burn it on farm, which would have value. But again, the biggest one traditionally has been manure management. And it, and, and also, as I mentioned, USDA programs uh, to help support the, 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 the financing of these facilities. And now you're talking, you know, in excess of a million dollars in additional uh, revenue on top of that. And that's why really almost any dairy uh, in the United States has really seen activity in this space. Even smaller dairies, Wisconsin dairies have often aggregated, you know, or worked collectively in small groups in the same area to put in a digester. Again, because the sums are just so large. Um, and that's really what I wanted to get across. First, I'm, I'm pretty excited that there's a project in state. Um, you know, this is, you know, one of the first that's done it with beef. Um, because we typically don't manage manure uh, in beef feedlots like we do with dairy or, or with hogs, uh, but, it, but it's here and, it, and it's significant. Uh, one of the big things too for all of us in agriculture and, and including here in North Dakota is we look at uh, expanding our animal egg industry. Uh, you know, this is really a critical consideration. You know, anybody who's looking at a new uh, facility, uh, you know, feeding operation is clearly this is on their radar. But even for existing operations, it's something to think about. It really does change the economics significantly. Uh, not so much so now that we're going to see uh, a shift or uh, call it the destruction of everybody else in the industry. We're seeing new growth. So expansion is taking place in this way. 
but it could we could certainly get to a point in the future where if a, a, a business does not have this technology in place, does not have that revenue, they may no longer be competitive uh, in, in their part of the business. Uh, also important to know too, is that the price of carbon credits have fallen significantly in the last two years. We've actually seen a, a pretty big slowdown in RNG projects. Uh, you know, it's it's less than half. It was about $200 a metric ton uh, in early 2021, 2020. Now it's about 80. Uh, but even at that level, you know, that incentive ends up being significant, especially anyone who has manure management challenge. Uh, this just ends up becoming gravy uh, on top of, of that decision. So that's what I had for my presentation. Um, and that concludes the presentations for the day. Um, we'd be very happy to answer any questions you might have. Again, you can use the Q&A tool or the chat. Uh, we'll be back next month on June 15th. And, and Brian, make note of that. Uh, it, it's a, a, a week later, right? Later in the month than it, than it typically yeah. seems. But we'll, we'll be back then. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Also, if anybody has any last minute points, or things they'd like to add to their presentation or questions for other presenters, uh, now is the time. And I was gonna say, did anybody guess $40 per MMBTU? I was, I was gonna promise, I was gonna promise I, I either mail uh, or hand deliver a, a fun size Snickers bar, but I don't think anybody got it. I wanted to make sure other people Um, just really quick, I did get an email um, while people were talking with uh, um, kind of a, a quick blast on the Kansas wheat numbers. Um, it looks as though the total for the three day tour is the average is going to be about is 30 bushels per acre. Um, the thir third day came in at 44.1, which is much higher than the rest of the state. Um, so 30 bushels per acre for 2023 relative to a 39.7 bushel estimate from last year. So again, um, very similar to the numbers that I had talked about before. So that's hot off the press. So should I go buy some flour today, Frayne, or am I good? Uh, you're good. All right. Well, it doesn't seem like we have any questions today. Uh, it's uh... It's summertime, so you should probably make the most of the weather while we have it. Um, with that, I'd like to thank the other specialists for presenting and, and for all the participants for attending, and we'll see you next month. Thanks. Mm -hmm.